The endless sense of waiting for something that never arrives. Whilst a common existential trait in human beings is no better demonstrated these days by the invention of the infinite scroll by engineer as a Raskin. Whilst you've probably never heard of him, you're inundated by his 2006 invention on a daily basis, since virtually all social media apps utilize his creation. Before it came pagination, where a user would reach the end of the page and have to choose whether or not to continue. It gave the user, and this here is actually worth noting, pause for thought. A chance to consider whether or not to continue, whereas the infinite scroll does the exact opposite. It keeps going endlessly, giving the user a sense of doing something whilst actually doing nothing. Everything's a copy of a copy of a copy. Unfortunately for all of us, to the human brain, this actually does come with a benefit. You probably know what I'm going to say. You're rewarded for the mindless indulgence with little spikes of that sweet, sweet dopamine. No matter how unearned, unhealthy and unrewarding it really is. I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, how many of us have not lost countless hours indulging the infinite scroll, sometimes without even realizing it? You open your phone on a whim, and before you know it, you're skimming between Discord and Insta and WhatsApp and the hub, and poof, three hours have disappeared into the ether. But at what cost to our mental faculties and ability to focus? Even Raskin himself later admitted in a tweet of all fucking things, one of my lessons from Infinite Scroll that optimizing something for ease of use does not mean best for the user or humanity. I've no idea if that's what he sounds like, by the way. I'm just, yeah, I'm just an asshole. In fairness to Raskin, he's hardly the first person in history to be horrified by his own creation. After all, I'm sure Nietzsche would have been pretty appalled by how the Nazis hijacked his ideas and perverted them for their own repulsive cause. Unless he was trying to impress his sister. That's such a weird reference, I don't know if anyone's going to get that. The reason many of us fall into the trap of the Endless Scroll is because, dopamine notwithstanding, we actively seek patterns and predictability. Thus, we are susceptible to such stimuli. Regrettably, though, the infinite scroll is itself the very pattern. Only most of the time, what we're scrolling through goes over our heads. It's as if we're actually training ourselves to make information go in one ear and out of the other. We don't even have to hit the refresh button any longer. Every app just keeps on reloading as we scroll ourselves into anxiety, depression and addiction, all whilst actually losing our creative abilities to boot, not to mention our very ability to focus in the first place. Oh, just in case anyone's interested, a lot of the concepts and themes in this video have been taken from Johan Hari's book Stolen Focus, which GC, speaking in third person, certainly recommends. Good book. This was a good read. This is not a sponsor, but well, I downloaded the book for free and I'm making a video about it, so fair is fair. As well as the aforementioned, the book also debunks a concept many of us adhere to today due to technological advances all the way back in the 1960s. It was in this decade that computer scientists put together machines with more than one processor so they could do two or more things at once simultaneously, which soon gave rise to the phrase multitasking. Typically, and in all our rampant narcissism, we soon started applying the term to ourselves. However, like most human flights of fancy, this all turned out to be a load of old bollocks. What human beings are actually doing when they believe themselves to be spinning plates, as it were, isn't multitasking, 
but simply switching from one thing to the other. Because of how consciousness works, we merely have the delusion of multitasking because the brain skims over each transition from one thing to the next, giving the impression of a seamless flow, but with that not really being the case. Not in the least, in fact. Also, just to add insult to neurological injury, there's a mental price to be paid during each and every switch. Say you're working on an email, and you get a DM from some thirsty e-girl. Not likely, but hey, this is my video, so suck my balls. You text the girl back and she says, thank you daddy, and you go back to the email. This seems like nothing, but the time it takes for you to fully regain the focus you just had on the email can be up to 20 fucking minutes. Now imagine a whole day of emails, texts from your harem, notifications, phone calls, etc, 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 that's a whole lot of switching, which is both fatiguing for the brain and, obviously, detrimental toward your focus. Just, just scrolling the script down. Patience. It also makes you dumber, if such a thing is a concern. So really, I mean, it's little wonder why we struggle to give our full attention to things these days. We've been conditioned not to. It's also kind of ironic to think of juggling, or use the phrase spinning plates, since the saying appears to suggest doing multiple things at the same time. But to an actual person juggling, or indeed spinning fucking plates, that's the single thing they're focused on, and likely the sole reason why they're even able to do it in the first place. It's a shit metaphor. Some of you might actually remember being criticised for daydreaming during school. I was. <laughs> However, this somewhat odd, though thoroughly human tendency, does actually serve a vital purpose. It's my assertion that this cognitive meandering works similarly, aptly enough, to dreaming itself, where the mind can process information received, make connections within its subjective understanding, and extrapolate meaning from any given experience. For instance, whenever I've finished a book or movie that I found particularly moving, my instinct isn't to jump on social media and find out what others had to say about it. Whilst I might eventually do that, there's an inclination to mentally digest the experience, to allow it to brew and settle in my mind's eye, as it were, especially when my convictions about the piece are somewhat conflicted due to the nuance of whatever it was. Many artists and creators will often have a surge of inspiration after having indulged such a process. And inspired by the book myself, the sentences being written now are due to the allowance I gave my mind after finishing it, where I went for an aimless walk around my local park without my phone or anything else to distract me, and just let my thoughts do whatever it is they wanted to do. I didn't even think about the book or what impressions it made, I just walked around for half an hour, essentially doing nothing but that. I can't really say if it worked, but the value of doing such a thing feels undeniable. After a few hours, some ideas came to mind on what to film, what I wanted to include in this vid, and how I could bring that forth in the edit. Allowing my mind to wander, I guess somewhat ironically, granted me a better grasp of what I had read, and what, in this instance, I wanted to say about it. If I'd jumped on Goodreads instead, I'd have probably just had some anecdotal one-star review stuck in my head. Point being, leaving yourself time to ruminate without even seemingly doing so is invaluable. It assists your focus, not the opposite. Of course, if you've spent a long time on social media, pseudo-multitasking as it were, your ability to monotask would have likely been compromised. For that reason alone, I again recommend the book. In a nutshell, instead of trying to focus for, say, an hour, do the reverse and make it a minute, then two, five, ten, etc. I mean, it might seem, feel, or even be stupid, but that's been social media's plan all along. 
So baby steps are the way to go. It's my contention that this mind-wandering habit of ours, whether intentionally so or not, has been hijacked by social media. Instead of taking a moment to process what you might have read, for example, or taken in what a lecturer was just talking about during a seminar, we're prompted, with or without a notification, to keep checking our apps for so-called updates and must-see changes. Really, we're probably just looking for an extra drip of dopamine, the same way a smoker wants that sweet, sweet nicotine. And my God, is it sweet. But the compulsive behavior is there all the same. I don't want to label everyone an addict, but well, we sure do display the behavior of one. Not to get all Tyler Durden about it either. Not your fucking khakis. But the things you consume end up consuming you. You were the all singing, all dancing crap of the world. Whenever you happen to use a social media app, you're already agreeing and signing a contract, cognitively speaking, because the medium is the message. This is a phrase coined by Canadian communication theorist Marshall McLuhan, meaning that the form of a message, be it in print, television, or via music, determines the ways in which that message will be perceived, meaning that the very medium plays a hugely significant, and some would argue, even more vital role than the message itself. Por ejemplo, what is the message in the medium of, say, Twitter? That one, 280 characters is enough to understand the world completely. Two, you shouldn't focus on any one thing for too long. And three, what matters most is that people agree with you. And that's about it. What? What's the message within the medium of Instagram? Everything, without exception, is about how you look. That's it. It's no wonder many a teenage girl gets severely depressed using such an app. Not only are they subjected to insane standards of beauty, but just by using the app itself, you are agreeing to a premise that in all likelihood, you do not agree with just to be able to use it. In essence, you're lying to yourself before even using the app in the first place endlessly subjecting yourself to a message that by its very design objectifies you. Being good looking used to be seen as a blessing for the lucky few. Nowadays it's seen as something attainable through hard work or purchasable through surgery. So if you do be ugly, it's now emblematic of a personal failure on your part. It's your fault, not just something that you happen to be born with. Phenomena in the manosphere, such as lookism, looks maxing, etc., didn't come about out of nowhere. They are the direct consequence of the very mediums themselves, hence the medium having more impact than the messages they deliver. It's shaping your perspective of the world through its own pair of spectacles. And remember, if it comes without a price tag, you are its free meal. It's a no-brainer why we have a propensity to believe we possess the traits of the technologies we utilize then, since the message of the medium is always reflected back at us. But the scatterbrained nature of an algorithm is designed only to keep you glued to the screen, not a thinking user of the medium, but instead its scatterbrained product. You become the consequence of its message. Was that profound or a load of gobbledygook? Let me know in the comments below. Such algorithms are now so powerful, in fact, that they induce magical thinking in us at best and paranoia at worst. How many of us have not had a moment when 
having simply mentioned to a friend that we're thinking about buying a certain product, a Wafu pillow, most likely in this instance, only to have our phones recommend the very thing a day or so later. But but I'm sure I only spoke to my mate about it the other day. I, I didn't Google it. So how did my phone know? We tend to think that this is proof of our phones listening in on our conversations. But in reality, and I actually think this is creepier, the algorithms are now so advanced that they can predict with unnerving accuracy what we're going to be thinking about in the future. Maybe after watching the 900th I Quit Social Media video on YouTube, you decide you're going to unplug from the Matrix yourself, even if escaping the Matrix has become its own rabbit hole in of itself. Good for you! Uh, getting that sweet rush of superiority as you delete all your apps isn't a bad way to start either. It ain't going to work though. The same way most heroin addicts can't just go cold turkey. Social media, even for people who don't use it, is just part of our lives now. And the longer you've been using it, the stranger the world and your own mind will seem once you come off it. If you imagine for one moment that social media came in the form of a drug, for one thing, it would be illegal. But secondly, it already operates like some of the most addictive drugs on the planet. Most certainly so when it comes to withdrawal. Let's say you want to start reading or maybe write a screenplay, paint a landscape, draw some hentai. Whatever you doing you is great. Stick with that. But don't go too hard on yourself if you find it difficult, especially at first. From personal experience, even after a few days of doing mindless bullshit, Going back to something like reading is a bit tricky. And I find there's a period where the flickering, glitchy nature of modern content, with its constant cuts and quirks and attention-grabbing visuals, has mirrored itself into my thought process, making it equally erratic, aware of everything, but focused on nothing. I mean, it makes sense when you think about it. If you've been pinballing your attention span this way and that, up and then down, in a kaleidoscopic helter-skelter, returning to something like words with its left-to-right linear fashion will feel like foreign and dull-as-fuck territory. Because by comparison, it is. <laughs> you've got to give the pinball time to settle before you can adjust yourself to the other medium again. But GC! I hear you cry. Doesn't that make books just another coping mechanism? If they're all the same thing, then what's the fucking point? Well, my lowly friend, fair point. But what's the message in the medium of literature? The entire human experience. All of its complexity, its ugliness, violence, beauty, grace, everything. It's even been scientifically proven to be the only pastime that actually encourages and increases your capacity for empathy. Whereas social media, contrary to what any Google or Microsoft-funded survey will tell you, does the exact fucking opposite. Also, and I do actually think this is worth bearing in mind, if you decide to kick something like Insta to the curb, but your whole friendship group uses it, prepare to be shunned and alienated by said group. Because even if they agree with you about being hooked on it, they're addicted too, so your decision to leave it behind will only reflect their own reliance on it, making you a mirror of their own addiction, and no one wants to see the reflection of their shortcomings and weaknesses. You're gonna be lonely. Lonely, lonely fucker. Lonely fucking ass. Really, like, on your jack. You, don't, you won't even have social media to cope with. You're gonna be one lonely motherfucker. Lonely ass bitch. Lonely. Lonely, you're gonna be lonely. Lonely, a lonely loser in all likelihood, but lonely guaranteed. Lonely motherfucker, no friendless, 
fucking social media less nothing very lonely it's an isolated place out there there's a reason you avoided it in the first place you know <laughs> welcome back <laughs> you're free to choose whatever cope you please but you cannot choose what your cope says about you so choose your cope wisely now This video actually came about because of my phone telling me how much screen time I spent last week. I don't generally allow any apps to send me notifications, but for some reason I make an exception for that one. Usually because if I go overboard, I try to amend it during that current week. However, this time around I gave it a bit extra thought. Whilst I can cope with the amount of time I spend on the social side of things, I came to the conclusion that if I am going to look at my phone, I should try and use that time wisely. So instead of using it mindlessly, I've started to read books on it too. As quite a few of you know, I am far from an advocate of ebooks. In fact, I'm pretty sure a part of me will always fucking loathe them. But I am also broke as fuck and books start to get expensive when food prices, of all things, are forever on the rise. So, yeah, bollocks. Um, I now read on my phone, and I recommend you do too. Even if it's just to feel as if you're being a little more productive with your time. I mean, it certainly looks better to see that I've been garnering information rather than mindlessly scrolling. Whilst it certainly isn't a solution to the addictive nature of social media, or why I feel the need to be rewarded by doing the things I naturally have a passion for in the first place by seeing it in some dumb bar chart that's essentially meaningless, it did help me regain some focus, read a book in two days, write this script and put this video together. And that's got to count for something, right? <laughs>